Okay, so hello everyone. I once again will ask you, and if you're a student, force you to uh, open your camera so we can have a, a good uh, interactive audience. Um, I'm very happy today to have a, a kind of unusual speaker. A speaker today is Dr. Avit Al Hahami, and it, she's unusual for two reasons. One, she's a postdoc, and we don't usually invite postdocs to give uh, talks. And uh, the second reason she's special is that she does really amazing work and she's really a stellar postdoc. Hey, during her PhD work, she has published Nature Neuroscience, eLife, J Neuroscience, and I'm probably missing a few. Um, and she does very, very interesting work. She did her PhD at the Wiseman Institute with uh, Rafi Malach, uh, which is uh, where we also met. And, uh, but she also worked both with Marlene Berman and with uh, Tamar Makin. And now she is doing her postdoctoral work with Tim Behrens at UCL. And she asked me to say that most of what she's going to show here actually dates back to her PhD. And it's not the new stuff she's working on now. So we have more to expect in her next talk. And yeah, thank you, Avital, for coming for, to us at the last day of Christmas vacation. And the stage is yours. My pleasure. Thank you. Very, very kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about plasticity and spontaneous brain activity in cases of early or late sensory deprivation. And I wanna start with an example of an experiment we ran at the Weizmann Institute. It's a visual fMRI experiment. And what you're gonna see is a, you're gonna hear a participant who describes what she sees. Okay, you're gonna hear the scanner noise. So try to ignore that. <laughs> אני יכולה לראות אבל ממש יוצא מהפנים, כמו פנים של בן אדם, עכשיו הוא ממש מולי, אבל עכשיו הוא מתשפש. Now, this may seem as a simple fMRI experiment, but in fact, the participants whom you were listening to is actually blind. And what she was describing is the content of her visual hallucinations. And the reason she experiences these hallucinations is because her visual cortex does not receive any more input because of this, bl this blindness. So throughout my talk, I'm gonna talk about cases of deprivation, of sensory deprivation, what happens in the brain because of these and what happens to emergent behavior. So I'm gonna start, I'm not gonna start, I'm gonna talk about the late blind, as I showed you now, we're gonna talk about the visual cortex. This is actually um, a paper recently published um, with my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Rafi Malach from the Weizmann. But I wanna start with a different case of early deprivation of people who were born without one hand, uh, one-handers. So there I'm gonna talk about the sensory motor system. And this is a series of paper that is unrelated to my PhD or my postdoc, just an ongoing collaboration with Professor Tamar Makin from UCL. Okay, so let's start. So um, the sensory motor system, um, it has multiple terminals. Um, there is the uh, cerebral cortex, there is the basal ganglia and the thalamus, there is the cerebellum. And all of these terminals have a somatotopic organization. And what this means is that if we take a slice through the central sulcus, for example, then we would find that along the sulcus, we would find body part representations. And we can depict this uh, organization, this somatotopic organization, as the homunculus. But what would happen to this homunculus if one hand is missing? So I'm going to describe the case of individuals born without one hand, one-handers. And before I'm going to start diving into the results, I want to start with a bit of terminology. So each one-hander has an intact hand controlled by the intact hand region in the cortex. Um, they have a missing hand or they lack a hand that should have been controlled by the contralateral hand region that is now deprived of its input. So I'm referring to it as the deprived hand region. And I'm going to con uh, compare one-handers to two-handed controls in whom the dominant hand is controlled by the dominant hand region and the non-dominant hand is controlled by the non-dominant hand region. Good. So what happens when a hand is missing? So under such circumstances, the deprived hand region is believed to undergo reorganization or the flexible reallocation of resources in the brain. So we have shown before that when one-handers move their residual arm like so, they actually activate both the residual arm representation, but also the deprived hand representation. So 
the deprived, uh, the residual arm representation actually invades into the hand representation. This is a form of reorganization. But what drives this sensory motor reorganization? Well, it may come as no surprise that the residual arm representation inv invades the hand one because these are neighboring areas. And it's basically practically textbook knowledge that neighboring areas can invade each other. So this could be all about somatotopy. But what I wanna propose during my talk is another hypothesis. And that is that compensatory behavior could be related to this um, interesting brain phenomenon. Um, and to understand what I'm saying, imagine how you would open a bottle of water if you had only one hand. I think you would imagine the easiest way is to just use your residual arm. So could it be that the arm of one-handers is now used instead of a hand? And to take up the function of a hand, it needs more cort cortical resources. So it needs to invade the hand representation. And this is why reorganization occurs. So throughout my talk, I'm gonna weigh evidence for both these possible hypotheses. Um, and I'm probably not gonna give you a bottom line. There are possibilities, uh, there, there is a possibility that any one of these is valid. So let's start like, by asking, is there really compensatory behavior in one-handers? Do they actually use their residual arm in bimanual tasks? So to understand this, we asked a group of one-handers and amputees. So those born without one hand, one-handers, and those who lost their hand throughout life, one amp amputees. We asked them to rate the level to which they rely on their residual arm on da in daily bimanual tasks, like wearing glasses or taking off a sweater. And we wanted to validate this questionnaire. So we asked a subsample of, of these participants to wear acceleration monitors on both their, their limbs. So we wanted to make sure that uh, if they report to show behavior that involves both limbs, we can actually see this in their actual daily routine. And we actually found a nice correspondence between the acceleration data and the questionnaire, which validated our questionnaire. We also find that one-handers who never had a hand compared to amputees who lost their hand, do indeed rely on their residual arm in daily tasks, in daily bimanual tasks. So, they, so, so yes, there is compensatory behavior of the stump. But can we measure the neural correlates of everyday compensatory behavior in the MRI scanner? And this is a hard thing to do because you may know that you can't really move in the MRI scanner. So how can we do this? So we recruited a group of 14 one-handers and 24 matched controls, and we simply asked them to do nothing. So we asked them to rest in the scanner. And it turns out that while we rest, our brain remains fully active. It shows spontaneous brain activity. These waves are ultra slow. What you see here is three times faster than what goes on in our, actually, in our actual brain. And you probably notice that we see co-activation of different areas in the brain. And these comprise functional networks. So we have a way of measuring these co-activations. It's called functional connectivity or correlation. So we would take two brain areas and we, and we would ask, is their, um, is their activity correlated across time? And areas that show correlated activity across time are called functionally connected. Now, why is this interesting? Because it has been proposed that these patterns of functional connectivity during resting state actually reflect our daily behavior. And this has to do with Hebb's law. So let's imagine that these two brain areas here are active in a habitual task, something we do every day then these two areas are always active together or are active together many times. Now, according to Hebb's law, neurons that fire together would wire together. So synaptic links would be formed be between these brain areas. And even during resting state, when we do nothing, any random noise in the system could be propagated through the, these synaptic links, causing this co-activation. So we wondered whether this resting state connectivity could serve as a probe for compensatory daily behavior in one-handers. So we ask one-handers and control to simply rest in the scanner. And what you see here is the deprived hemisphere and the deprived hand area, independently defined. And we ask which, across the entire brain, which brain areas are most functionally connected to the deprived hand areas in one-handers and in controls. And what you see here is the contrast between the, the, brain, the correlations of the two groups. And what you find to differentiate these groups is this area here, which falls right within the intact hand area. So this basically means that the intact hand area is less functionally connected to the deprived hand area in one-handers compared to controls. So if we take an independent definition of these two areas and we just measure their correlations during resting state, we would find 
that controls have a higher level of correlation between the hand areas, but one-handers have a reduced level of, of correlation. But this is a group effect, and there is also variability here to be accounted for. And what we found to account for much of this variability is the level to which one-handers report to rely on their residual arm in daily tasks. So those that rely on their residual arm show a high level of functional connectivity between the hand areas. In fact, what you see here in red is the mean and confidence interval of two-handed controls. And those one-handers who don't have a hand are no different in their connectivity between the hand areas than two-handed controls as long as they rely on the residual arm in daily life. Now, how do we interpret this? So I showed you that when one-handers move their residual arm, they actually activate the deprived hand region. Now, if they have a, if they have a compensatory daily behavior, they would use their residual arm, activating the deprived hand cortex, along with the intact hand, which activates the intact hand cortex. So overall, the two hand cortices would be, would be co-active. And if they fire together, they would wire together. And therefore, during resting state, when they don't move at all, then we would see that in, in those that have compensatory behavior, we would find high functional connectivity between the two hand areas. And this teaches us something about one-handers, but there is also a side point to remain here, because to the best of my knowledge, this has been the first evidence that spontaneous connectivity patterns indeed reflect the natural statistics of our everyday behavior. Okay, but back to our question. So what drives sensory motor reorganization? It could be somatotopy, but now we also know that there is compensatory behavior in one-handers and it is imprinted in the brain. So could this compensatory behavior drive the organization? How do we differentiate between these two options? It's, it, yeah, we actually can't because the arm representation is the immediate neighbor of the hand representation. So it could be somatotopy, but we also know there's compensatory behavior of the arm. So we can differentiate between these options for the uh, residual arm representation. But think again how you could open a bottle of water if you have only one hand. And there are other possibilities that come to mind. You could use your intact hand or your legs or your lips. And if we find that one-handers indeed rely on these body parts, then we can look at reorganization in their brain. And the important thing is that the intact hand representation is very far away from the deprived hand region. It's on the other hem hemisphere. And the representations of the legs and the lips are also very far away from the hand region. So if we, found, if we find reorganization such that movements of these body parts activate the deprived hand region, this is less likely to be related to somatotopy and may be related to compensatory behavior. So first, how do we measure compensatory behavior in daily life? We design a set of ecological tasks which are done outside the scan. For example, opening a bottle of water. So indeed, one-handers uh, show, some of them use their residual arm, some of them use um, their intact hand uh, and their prosthetic, some of them use their legs or their feet, and some of them use their lips. So to quantify this behavior, we recruited an, an independent set of participants, 17 one-handers and 24 two-handed controls. And we had independent raters watch these behaviors and rate to the level to which both one-handers and controls rely on different body parts when carrying out these tasks. So what you can see here is the behavioral results. And you can see um, in one-handers in white and controls in gray. And the first thing I want you to notice is that both groups heavily rely on movements of the intact hand, which makes sense because it's a bimanual task, right? They need it, at least one hand. However, one-handers are no different in the way they use their intact hand compared to controls. There is no compensation or overuse of the intact hand when they move, when they carry out these bimanual tasks. However, they do overly use the lips and the legs when carrying out these tasks. So there is compensatory behavior of the lips and the legs. So how does this look like in the brain? We ask these participants to move either the intact hand or their lips or their feet in the scanner. And what you see here is the deprived hemisphere. You can see the deprived hand, uh, the deprived hand cortex in green. And when we are comparing the activations between groups for movements of the intact hand, which is not used for compensation, you see no yellow blobs here, meaning no group differences. However, when using body parts used for compensation, the lips and the legs, you can see that one-handers activate the deprived hand cortex more than controls, which we interpret as reorganization. Now, can we think of other ways of 
understanding whether indeed compensatory behavior is related to this brain reorganization. Well, we know that spontaneous connectivity may reflect the natural statistics of behavior. So we can look at resting state in these participants. And what you see here again is the deprived hemisphere. So if indeed there is reorganization in the brain of one-handers, then whenever they move their lips, they would activate the lip area, but also the deprived hand area. And whenever they move their feet, they would activate the feet area, but also the deprived hand area. So a lot, we would expect to find during resting state higher functional connectivity or correlation between the hand representation and each of these representations in one-handers compared to controls, which is indeed what we find. Okay, so I just want to show you the exact same maps again of our basic effects. So the exact same maps. Residual arm movements or lip movements or feet movements, all these body parts used for compensation actually show reorganization in the brains of one-handers. You can see this nice blob in the hand area. And we can see the same effect. We can see it's specific to the deprived hand region. So you can see that one-handers in white show more activity in the deprived hand area compared to controls in gray. But this doesn't happen for the intact hand area, but, but only for the deprived hand area. So we show a specific effect. And the effect is also specific to those body parts used for compensation because we don't see it for the for movements of the intact hand, which is not used for compensation. So it could be indeed that somatotherapy does not restrict reorganization in the cerebral cortex. Now, this effect is very robust. It is so robust that we can actually replicate it across two additional independent data sets. So this is a lot to take, so you can ignore most of it. Just look at the, at the white bars. They are higher in one-handers compared to controls in all conditions that involve body parts used for compensation. So how do we interpret these results? First of all, it seems that proximity between body part representations is not a prerequisite for reorganization in the cerebral cortex. This is because also those body part representations that are far away from the hand can nevertheless invade the hand area. Reorganization may be related to compensatory daily behaviors. This is only a working hypothesis because I haven't shown you any correlations between brain and behavior. And of course, this, this, these are neurocorrelates. We can't really say anything causal here. And finally, there's a nice speculation to be made here. So we tend to think about the hand area in the cortex as representing the body part that is the hand. But having the opportunity to look at people who never had a hand, we can see that the hand area actually represents any body part that acts instead of a hand, that takes the functionality of the hand, the lips or the feet. So perhaps, and this is only a speculation, Perhaps the hand area is not the hand area per se, but the hand function area. Okay, so more evidence in favor of compensatory behavior driving reorganization is that remote representation that are related to compensatory behavior can invade the hand area. So I showed you reorganization in the cerebral cortex, where the hand representation is equally distant from the lip representation and the feet representation. But as I showed you before, we have many terminals in the sensory motor system. So we could also look at the cerebellum. And here we have a different, different somatotopic structure. Here the, the, the hand representation is the immediate neighbor of the lip representation, but it's further away from the, lip, from the uh, feet representation. So if we have two terminals with different somatotopic structure, and we believe that somatotopy should drive reorganization, then we would expect to find different patterns of reorganization in the brain that matches that somatotopic structure. But this is not what we see. We see the exact same pattern in the cerebellum as we see in the cerebral cortex. So what you see here is a flattened map of the cerebellum. You can see uh, in yellow the deprived hand region. You can see the feet representation and the lip representation. And you can see uh, in this group contrast that movements of the lips and feet used for compensation activate the deprived hand cortex. This doesn't happen for movement of the intact hand not used for compensation. You may also notice that we don't see uh, a whole brain effect for the residual arm movements. This is probably because in the cerebellum, the arm representation almost completely overlaps with the hand representation. So any further overlap between them caused by reorganization would be very hard to find we can see it in a more sensitive ROI analysis of the hand region. So across all body parts used for compensation, we can see that one-handers activate the deprived hand region more than controls. This is specific to the deprived hand region. We don't see it for the intact hand region, and we don't see it for the intact hand movements. Again, this effect is very robust, and we can replicate it in an additional set of participants. 
Okay, but we don't have to stop there. We've got more terminals, for example, the basal ganglia. And here we can look at the putamen. And in the putamen, there is another different uh, um, somatotopic arrangement here. The hand region is the immediate neighbor of both the lip representation and the feet representation. Nevertheless, we see the exact same effect as we see in other sensory motor terminals. Movement of body parts used for compensation, residual arm, lips, and feet, activate the deprived putamen in one handers more than in controls. This doesn't happen for the intact hand movements. So more evidence in favor of compensatory behavior driving reorganization is that different sensory motor terminals with different somatotopic arrangements show the exact same pattern of reorganization that relates to what we see in compensatory behavior. Does this mean that somatotopy does not drive reorganization? Well, not necessarily. So we could imagine that somatotopy is, has to drive reorganization. There can be no reorganization without somatotopic arrangements. So only neighboring body parts can invade each other. Across all areas that I showed you, the only place where this can happen is actually the putamen. Here, the, the hand representation is the immediate neighbor of the lips and the feet representation. So let's assume there is reorganization in the putamen. So inputs from the uh, feet and from the lips invade the deprived hand cortex. But the sensory motor system is a closed loop one. So inputs from the hand area would propagate to the deprived hand areas of other sensory motor terminals. And when we look at our fMRI data in the cerebral cortex, for example, and we see, hey, when, when these individuals move their, their lips and their feet, we see activation in the deprived head cortex, we would interpret this as reorganization that happens in the cortex, but in fact, it could be a mere reflection of something that, if something that happens somewhere else in the putamen. So it could be that, that somatotopy in the putamen draw, is reflected as reorganization in the cerebral cortex or cerebellum. So although this is um, a speculation, it could still be that somatotopy drives reorganization. Now, finally, for this part, I want to ask, your, I want to ask a question. So how do these remote inputs from the lips and from the feet enter into the hand area? So I want to propose a possible mechanism by which this could occur. So we know that the homuncular structure is based on lateral inhibition. Whatever representation is now active, it would suppress its neighboring representations. But now we take the main input from the hand area. So there's no need to inhibit it. So this lack of input would probably lead to reduced inhibition. We actually measured this in the scanner. We, we used um, MR spectroscopy, which allows us to measure the concentrates, uh, the concentrates of different metabolites in the brain. For example, GABA, which is the main neuroinhibitor. And we measured the level of GABA in the deprived and intact hand regions in one handers and in two handers. And what we found was that in the deprived hand cortex of one handers, there is a reduction in GABA compared to controls and compared to the intact hand region. So it could indeed be that there is a reduced inhibition over the deprived hand cortex of one handers. What would this lead to? Well, if there is less inhibition over an area, we could find many things there. So even in our brain, the hand area is connected to the entire brain. So it is expected that we would find weak inputs from different areas across the brain in the hand area. But now we take away the main input in one handers and we remove inhibition. So we could be just unmasking inputs that are otherwise silenced. Uh, we also measured th this, again, using resting state function connectivity. We took the deprived hand, hand cortex and the intact hand cortex, but this time we measured their correlation with the rest of the brain. This is what we call the global signal. And what you can see here is that the deprived hand cortex in one handers is more connected to the rest of the brain compared to the intact hand cortex and compared to controls. So it could indeed be that all these inputs that we see in reorganization are always there, but only because of this reduced inhibition, we can now expose them. So in a sense, there is no active reorganization, the flexible reallocation of resources in the brain, but rather the unmasking of inputs that are always there. So this can actually serve as a mechanism by which either somatotopy or compensatory behavior could drive reorganization. And let me explain. So when we talk about somatotopy, we can talk about the residual arm representation. You may notice that the residual arm representation really overlaps the one of the deprived hand. Um, so now, so whenever we move the residual arm, this representation inhibits the hand representation. But now if there's no inhibition, then obviously we would find these inputs that were always there in the deprived hand cortex. How does this relate to compensatory behavior? 
Well, first of all, we need to remember that the main inputs and the main um, connectivity of the deprived hand cortex is the intact hand cortex, even in one-handers, because the, the hands are, are wired to work together. But now in one-handers, we have some very weak inputs coming from different body part representations. But these weak inputs may very weakly activate the deprived hand cortex along with the intact hand cortex if they are activating this cortex during um, compensatory behavior. And because the intact hand representation is active along with the deprived hand representation through uh, heavy and light co-activations, only those inputs that are related to compensatory behavior could actually be consolidated in the deprived hand cortex. Um, so this is a hypothetical uh, mechanism that could underlie each of these hypotheses. Okay, so let's summarize this part of my talk. Um, what we can say for sure is that somatotopy in the cerebral cortex does not restrict re brain re reorganization. This is because remote brain representations can reorganize into the hand cortex. This is because different sensory motor terminals show different somatotopic reorganization, but still show the same uh, show different somatotopic structures, but the same pattern of reorganization. We also have uh, some hypotheses um, that reorganization may be related to compensatory daily behavior, that cerebral reorganization may depend on somatotopy in upstream brain regions, for example, the putamen, possibly other areas, and that there may be no active brain reorganization in one-handers. Um, so this is the first part of my talk. If you have any questions about this part, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll go on with the second part. So I have a question, Avital, if I can. Yeah. So there's recently been an elegant paper, I think it was Nature Neuroscience, where they actually mobilized the hand. And you know this paper? Uh, maybe, remind me. So they, they, they mobilized the hand of people and they let them walk around for a week and they scanned them a few times over the course of this week or two weeks, I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the striking finding there was that the uh, resting state network started changing immediately. So just ha not being able to move your hand, so in this case, it'd be kind of like a, maybe an amputation in the sense that you cannot no, you no longer get the motor signals, immediately change the configuration of the resting state networks. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So I wonder how this kind of evidence fits in with the, the, your idea regarding the, the use. Is this just a rapid reconfiguration or maybe yeah. this needs to be based on actually ongoing inputs at every moment? Yeah, so this actually, so yeah, so this relates to the question of this, the, is it an early state of deprivation during development or a late state, like when casting people or in amputation, as you say. Um, actually, we have some evidence for this also from the, the blind, which I'll get to later. So it is true that it takes very little time after deprivation to see changes in the brain. We can see it in the blind, we can see it uh, in the amputated brain not the amputated brain, in the brain, in the brain of amputees. But the, I think the main question is, is this reorganization, reorganization functional? So we may see differences in the brain. It will be reorganized, but does it relate to behavior? And I think the main conclusion for now, from the blind literature at least, is that reorganization that, is, uh, that happens in an early state of development tends to be related to behavior. We're not yet sure how this reorganization relates to behavior in later stages. Um, so for example, in the, uh, in the late blind or when just um, closing people's eyes for several days, we see hyper excitability of the visual cortex. Uh, it's not entirely clear if this gives them any behavioral advantage or in fact relates to any behavior at all. Okay. Um, which, as, which is actually, it's a great question because uh, I'm gonna talk about that uh, in a second. Um, in my next uh, part of my talk. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, if no further questions, so let's um, summarize and move on. So I talked about congenital one-handers and as Roy uh, rightfully mentioned, they were born without one hand. Um, and I talked about plasticity and the behavior that emerges uh, that may re be related to this plasticity. Uh, and this is task-oriented behavior because it's related to the environment and the fact that they have to cope with an environment that requires by manual coordination and they don't have a hand. So this uh, behavior is related to the task they have to perform. And we also saw that spontaneous connectivity may reflect the natural statistics of behavior. 
But now I want to talk about cases of late deprivation in the blind. And we're going to talk about the visual uh, system here. And instead of talking about plasticity, I want to talk about the opposite of plasticity, what I will refer to as preserved representations. And to understand what I mean, I want to go back to the sensory motor system for the last time. So I so far talked about one-handers who never had a hand, but you probably all know the phenomenon uh, in late amputees where people who have lost their hand in a later stage in life actually can feel their hand. This is called phantom pain. And it has been shown that if you ask these people to lie in the scanner and move their non-existing hand, they can do it. And they also can activate the deprived hand cortex when doing that. However, the more they activate the deprived hand cortex, that is, the more preserved the representation of the hand, the more phantom sensation they experience. So in this sense, the preserved representation actually supports phantom sensation. And I want to try to claim a similar thing about the blind. So preserved representations in the late blind, in the late blind preserved representations in the visual cortex may underlie phantom vision, hallucinations. Now, this work is unrelated to my collaboration with Tamar Makin. It, uh, it, is, a, uh, it is something that I did um, during my PhD with Rafi Malach. It was only recently published. And the reason I was interested in this is my own interest in spontaneous brain activity, which I told you about previously. So we know a lot about spontaneous brain activity, but we don't really know if this brain activity could actively underlie behavior. Um, and it has been proposed before, theoretically, that spontaneous brain activity may underlie spontaneous behavior. So let me explain what this means. Um, we tend to think about behavior as being evoked from the outside. For example, this um, pink stimulus here may evoke activity in our brains. And if this activity has enough amplitude to cross some hypothetical uh, ignition threshold, then we would find stimulus-related behavior. But these spontaneous fluctuations could occasionally gain enough amplitude to, amplitude to cross the exact same threshold. And then we would also see behavior, but this behavior would not be related to some outside stimulus, but it would be just unprompted or spontaneous. Now, I was very interested in this hypothesis, but it's a very hard one to test because how can you test whether spontaneous neural activity underlies unprompted behavior? I mean, you would think that you can ask participants to just behave spontaneously, but you can't, that's a spontaneity killer. On the other hand, if participants are behaving, then what you would see in their brain is not spontaneous activity, it would be task evoke activity, and we don't know how to differentiate these two. So to tackle this, we decided to study late onset blind individuals. And the reason was that in their visual cortex, there is no external vision evoked activity. It's more likely to be spontaneous. But we also chose to study those individuals that experience visual hallucinations. And these hallucinations are as vivid as typical vision. And these people saw before, so they can actually tell us that in, in a lot of confidence. And since neither the appearance or the content of these hallucinations is controlled by the, sub, the, by the subjects, then we take these as truly unprompted perceptual behavior. Now, this uh, phenomenon is called the Charles Bonnet syndrome. It happens in people who have lost their eyesight. It is not related to any uh, psychopathology or neurological disorder. Um, and the problem is, is that these individuals tend to be very ashamed of what they experience. So they know they're blind, they know it doesn't make sense that they can see, but yet they can see. And many times they wouldn't tell anyone about it, not their physician, not their family members. So it's very hard to find these participants. We managed to find five. The first one sees a face that she has never seen before when she could see, but it's the same face that she hallucinates over and over again. And it can appear anywhere in her visual field and come and go. The second one um, sees ghost-like faces and different kinds of patterns. The third one sees still images of different visual categories, faces, objects, um, places. And these three participants can very accurately uh, describe their hallucinations, both in time and in space. We also recruited two participants who can give this accurate report because their hallucinations are very rapid and they occur simultaneously across the visual field. So the first one hallucinates very rapid flashes of light, and the second one hallucinates something that looks like a kaleidoscope. Now, we also recruited 11 late onset blind controls who have never hallucinated, and 13 sighted controls. And 
what we asked our participants to do, our um, Charles Bonnet syndrome participants, which I'll refer to as CBS participants, were asked to lie in the scanner and just describe what they hallucinate. And we recorded these um, reports, so it could look like a face appears, it turned right, it disappeared. And then after the scan, we played back these reports to them and asked them to give as many details as they can about the content of these hallucinations. Um, and then based on this temporal knowledge that we have about when hallucinations occurred and what they actually saw, we built simulated hallucinations, which I showed you in the beginning of my talk. And we showed these movies to sighted controls that were asked to report what they see. So um, this is the first example that I showed you. Um, this is an example of the second participant who hallucinates different patterns and ghost-like faces. And this is the example of the hallucinatory stream of the third participant who sees different still images that can occur in different locations in the visual, in the visual, in visual um, field. Now, obviously we, we have no way of, of accurately mimicking these hallucinations, but the temp we try our best to um, be accurate in the temporal aspect because we know when they occur and in their main category of visual um, stimuli. Okay, so we have two experimental conditions. We have hallucinations in the blind that are spontaneous occurrences of vision, and we have simulated hallucinations that are cued by our stimuli. But there is also another difference between these conditions, and that is that hallucinations are internally generated and a simulated hallucination or movie is externally generated. So to isolate the, spon the spontaneous component of this um, hallucination phenomenon, we introduced another condition, which is visual imagery. So here, the vision is cued because we tell participants when to imagine, but the actual content is internally generated just like in hallucinations. So the only visual condition where we see spontaneous vision is hallucinations. And we have two hypotheses about this condition. First of all, in the anatomic domain, because these hallucinations are as vivid as typical vision, and because we believe there is preserved representation, then it would make sense that the entire visual cortex, the entire visual machinery would be used to create this very vivid um, vision. So hallucinations like other type of vision would activate the entire visual hierarchy. However, in the temporal domain, we believe this is related to spontaneous brain activity. So hallucinations would differ from other types of vision in the spontaneous buildup of activity prior to perceptual events. So for the cued condition, first the stimulus would appear or the instruction would be given and only then the bold signal would rise. In the hallucination condition, first the bold signal would rise and only then the hallucination would appear. This is a marker for spontaneous brain activity. So first let's look at what happens in the brains of these blind individuals who hallucinate. So you see an inflated cortex on the right and the flattened one on the left. It's without threshold because I want you to appreciate the actual spread of activation. In red contours, you can see areas that are significantly activated by hallucinations. They're also corrected from multiple comparisons. And you can see they actually spend the entire visual cortex. So yes, hallucinations engage the entire visual cortex. Now, is it similar to um, simulated hallucinations in the blind, to, to vertical vision? Well, here you can see that the activity was more confined to the foveal representation of the cortex. This is probably because our stimuli had to be small enough to allow movements on the display screen. So we didn't do a very good job at, acti at stimulating the periphery representation of the cortex. Nevertheless, if you take the contours of this significantly activated areas of hallucination and superimpose them on this uh, vision, vertical vision map, you can find some level of overlap. And we actually quantified this overlap by measuring the, temp the spatial correlations of activity across the entire posterior part of the brain between participants of the two groups, and we found a very significant overlap. Now let's look at this same map again, the same hallucination map, but this time let's compare it to visual imagery in the same participants. And again, you can see activation of the visual cortex. And if we superimpose the hallucination contours on this imagery map, we find a nice overlap. But this is a very small sample. It doesn't allow us to do very good statistics. So we take the population from which the CBS participant originates, the blind uh, controls, and they also uh, show very nice activation of the visual cortex. And if we superimpose the hallucination contours onto their map, we can see a nice overlap, which is also supported by a nice correlation between the spatial patterns across the entire posterior part of the brain. 
So it seems indeed that hallucinations like other types of vision activate the entire visual hierarchy, preserved representation just like in phantom pain. But what about the temporal aspect? We hypothesize that some spontaneous fluctuation could accumulate and um, be evident prior to hallucination onset. To test this, we used three ROIs, early visual cortex, V1 to V4, the bilateral FFA, and a control area, the lips, because these participants speak in the scanner, so this, act, uh, this um, area would be engaged by the task, but it's not part of the visual system. We shouldn't find any effect there. So if we look at early visual cortex, what you see here is the signal in the CBS participants in green. And you, and you can see that the signal rises and only then the hallucination appears as apparent in the dashed line. But in the sighted controls in black, first the visual stimulus appears and only then the bold signal rises. And importantly, this is specific to the hallucination condition. It's not some attribute of the brain of these uh, hallucinating individuals because we don't find any group differences during visual imagery. Now we find the same effect, uh, although reduced in its amplitude for the FFA, but importantly, we don't find any group differences for the lip area, which is not part of the visual system. So here, first the stimulus appears or the hallucination appears and only then the signal rises in all groups. So it seems that hallucinations differ from other types of vision in the buildups of spontaneous activity prior to perceptual events. Now, as I mentioned, there was a reduction in the level of our effect between early visual cortex and higher order visual areas. So we wanted to see if this early buildup of signal is uniform across the visual system. So we ranked visual areas ba based on their location on the visual hierarchy. And for each individual area, we asked, when does the signal rises compared to the onset of hallucination? And a negative number here would mean that first the signal rises, only then the hallucination appears. And as you can see here, you have the rank on the, of the, on the visual hierarchy and you have the signal rise. Most areas sure show this increase in signal before the hallucination occurs. But it, this effect is most pronounced in early visual cortex, as if the signal is propagating through the cortex as we would expect during vertical vision. And, and here you may say, hey, hang on, I mean, visual signals take around 50 milliseconds to propagate from early to late, uh, to late uh, visual representation. How can you even see this uh, given the sluggishness of the bold signal? Well, I remind you, we're now looking at spontaneous brain activity, which is ultra slow in the, in the level of seconds. So we may be able to just see the propagation of the signal across the visual hierarchy. And importantly, this effect is again specific to the hallucination condition in these individuals because we don't see this effect when they imagine. So we see this ant anticipatory spontaneous activity which decays along the visual hierarchy during hallucinations. Now let's sum up. I showed you that visual hallucinations, like other visual experiences, engage the entire visual system. We compared hallucinations, vertical vision, and imagery. I also claimed that the buildup of bold activity is only evident prior to hallucinations. Now, how can we interpret this? What may be happening is that in early visual cortex of these individuals, some spontaneous fluctuation would, may cross this hypothetical activation threshold. This would ignite the visual system so it would propagate through the machinery used for vision and create vision as we used to, to experience it. And this may mean that spontaneous brain activity may indeed underlie spontaneous behaviors. And if this is the case, then it's tempting to speculate that perhaps in other more common cases of visual deprivation, for example, when we close our eyes and go to sleep, then perhaps our visual cortex is ignited by spontaneous activity in early visual cortex, which give rise to other types of visual hallucinations, dreams. Um, so let's sum up everything that I told you so far. Um, we looked at two cases of visual deprivation, an, all, an early one in one-handers and a late one in the blind. In the early sensory deprivation, I talked about plasticity. In the late case, I talked about the lack of plasticity, uh, the um, preserved representations. And I also try to claim that the behaviors that are related to these different phenomena are different themselves, because in the case of one-handers, the behavior is task-oriented, it's compensatory, it's used to cope with the environment, whereas in the blind, it is a task-free behavior, it is unrelated to the environment. And finally, talking about my own passion of spontaneous brain activity, 
For the, blood, for the congenital one-handers, I claim that spontaneous connectivity may in fact reflect the natural statistics of behavior, whereas in the late blind, it is not the pattern of correlation between these fluctuations, but rather the, the, the activity itself, the fluctuations themselves, that give rise to unprompted behavior. Um, I want to thank my many collaborators on, these work, on this work, uh, Professor Tamai Makin and members of her lab in UCL. Uh, for the ongoing collaboration about one-handers. Um, my PhD advisor, Rafi Malach, and the many people who collaborated with me on the CBS paper, Marlene Berman, and Emeital Wilf, and Boris Ossin. I want to thank the many uh, funding agencies that support my work, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Avital, for a very rich and fantastic talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Can I ask something? Hey, hello. Hi. <laughs> nice Mital, to go you. ahead. Virtually. Um, okay. This so, is Mital, by the way, one of my collaborators in this work. <laughs> no conflict of interest. <laughs> so regarding your sum summary slide, yeah. it got me thinking. Yeah. Uh, you compare these two cases of the one-handers and the blind, but I there is a very substantial difference between these two phenomena. One is that the, the Bonnet syndrome, they actually gain function. They gain an experience. And the, in the one-handers, when they lose their hand, yeah. So I don't they really think, so they, I think, oh, sorry. I, I mean, so I think that maybe the tendency, the, the, the connecting uh, line between the two phenomena that you described is that the brain always prefers to experience something and that the, the, there will not be any silence. And this goes back to the spontaneous. It, and what would you expect to happen with the amputees or you actually, sh did you show it? Okay, so I totally agree with you. I, I don't actually think they gain any experience. I think they just regain what they used to have, right? They used mm -hmm. to see the people with uh, charles Bonnet syndrome and they just don't lose it. They, uh, the representations are the same and their experience is the same, but the content is now not something that is evoked from the outside, but from the within. Um, so the amputation question is a very good one. So I didn't personally do any work related to amputees, but I can tell you that, um, for example, in phantom pain, um, unlike previous views of phantom pain, it is now shown that indeed this preserved representation of the hand area is related to the phantom sensation, just like the preserved representation in the visual cortex may be related to the phantom vision. So I think there is something that is very unique to late onset deprivation compared to early ones. Uh, and it's, it's actually may relate to the, this plasticity versus its absence. Mm -hmm. And how does it, uh, the blind uh, result, how does it uh, coincide with the uh, findings of um, Amila Mehdi that other senses uh, or other functions take control of the visual cortex. So how do they work together, these hallucinations and memory and uh, auditory? Sure. So first of all, so I, I want to say two things about uh, this. First of all, it's nice that you mentioned Amila Mehdi. Um, so Amila Mehdi, for example, uh, claims for many years now that the, the brain is a global machinery. It is any brain area is task specific rather than modality specific. I think that um, our hypothesis that the hand area is not the hand area or the hand, but rather the hand function area actually is in agreement with that. As for other findings of what happens to the visual cortex, bear in mind that most of these findings are related to congenital blindness, right? So people born without the ability to see. And there, there are many, many evidence showing reorganization that, may, that is actually functional. Uh, whereas in the Charles Bonnet syndrome, again, this is a late onset deprivation. So Bonnet is, on, is not for congenitals? No. So sorry if I didn't stress this enough. These people lost their eyesight. And this is actually why they can describe their hallucinations and we know what they mean. Mm -hmm. If we had people who have never seen before and they say, I see a face, I wouldn't be able to know what they mean by a face. But these people lost their eyesight actually not that long ago and they experienced to see as clearly and as vividly during their hallucinations as they did when they were able to see actual things in the environment. Thank you. 
I have a question unless I can't see everyone. So if someone has a question before me, just shout out. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. One is kind of technical and the yeah. other is uh, more conceptual. And I was wondering your opinion. So the first thing is that here your, uh, your imagery condition was in fact cued. So it wasn't spontaneous imagery, but under your idea, this might be related to kind of a, a rise in spontaneous activity. So if I'm just lying in bed and with my eyes shut, would I probably have at higher chances of seeing some imagery when I go through a kind of a high resting state uh, wave? Okay, so um, so let's like, take it one at a time. Um, the that important was, that was the only first one. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. So I would just want to remember what, uh, what you asked. Uh, so what I showed you here, the imagery, the, the spread of activity in imagery, the map I showed you was actually in the blind, okay? Now in sighted controls, Visual imagery is uh, the extent to which it activates the visual cortex is actually debated. Some studies show that only high order representations are activated and lower ones are actually deactivated. And some show more spread of activity. So it's an unresolved question. But I think that in the sighted brain, imagery would not necessarily be uh, subserved by the same mechanism as in the blind. It wouldn't be as uh, vivid necessarily. And maybe this is just because that we have to inhibit um, our vision of the environment to be able to imagine. And we know there's a lot of variability in our ability uh, to do visual imagery. And in most of us, it is not clear vision, nothing like what is described for hallucinations. So I doubt it that if you just randomly lie down, uh, you would be able to imagine through this mechanism of spontaneous brain activity as vividly as the blind do or uh, during hallucinations. Okay. That was it. My question is more, they, so for instance, we know that if you have a, a high level of spontaneous activity in your hand region, this might uh, bring you closer to a threshold of making a movement. So in the same yes. sense, I was talking more about the temporal uh, evolution yeah. of this. So, okay. if I'm going through, so if I have my eyes shut and I'm now kind of in a temporary blind condition, would they, if I have a wave going through my FFA, am I more likely to be, have kind of a spontaneous vision? So, yes. Yeah, so, so I don't know. It sounds, to me, it sounds reasonable. I mean, if we take about the, if we talk about the motor system, let's take the famous Libet experiment, right? The readiness potential. So they show that when they ask participants to move whenever they want to press a button, they see this accumulation of signal before they actually decide to move. So this could be, to me, this could be interpreted as spontaneous brain activity that accumulates. The only problem is that they ask participants to move, right? So this is not really a spontaneous behavior and it's hard to separate spontaneous from task evoked activity. But yes, in cases where your behavior is completely spontaneous, that my own working hypothesis is that random fluctuations could actually cause the activation of whole networks or parts of networks and this would be evident in spontaneous behavior. This, of course, needs much more work to actually prove. Uh, actually, this was shown partially for the, um, how do you call it, hypnagogic uh, hallucinations before falling asleep, that there is actual like, spontaneous activity in specific brain visual areas that activate specific uh, images. Cool. Uh, the brain area responsible for fall, feeling a sensation of falling down. <laughs> Also, <laughs> okay. Uh, so my second question is more general, and I'm uh, I'm not sure. But there's a very strange finding that uh, early blindness seems to be protective from psychosis. Okay, so people get blinded in very early stage. In fact, there's even a discussion if there are any psychosis patients who are uh, who are blind from very early age. And on the other hand, when you get blinded in the later age, this is very indicative. It really raises your chances of a uh, both uh, hallucinations, Anton Babinski syndrome, Charles Bonnet. So I was wondering if you any have any take on how something, how being blind early on might pro be protective of getting, losing your sight later on it kind of really induces the, your chance of having hallucinations. So I don't know these findings. So again, losing your eyesight at an early age would protect you from psychosis? There is no verified case of someone who was blinded before the age of six who has psychosis. Wow. Which is amazing, statistically. It's a very strange kind of finding. So I don't know. It's, in, it's super interesting. Uh, my two cents on this, which are based on nothing, is that perhaps some early plasticity that is 
related to the environment, which requires functional engagement with the environment, may be related. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't really know how to relate that yeah. to psychosis. I've never thought about that. Do, do you have any idea? There has been, it's been suggested that if you don't, not by me, by Phil Claret, that uh, it, if you don't have these early visual impairments, so the, the way your uh, kind of predictive coding mechanism embraces itself versus the world, it uh, uses more high level priors. So if you can't see okay. stuff, you have to kind of keep in your mind what stuff, where stuff should be. So you're engaging okay. more these high level priors, and this makes you less susceptible to hallucinations later on, which is what we see in psychosis. And the kind of breakdown we see in psychosis doesn't happen in that. Interesting. Place. But this is also a hand waving. Very, very interesting. Okay. Any more questions? Students, you're really welcome to ask questions as well. We've been trying to uh, see uh, how to make this happen. So if anyone has a question, we're very happy to take it. Could you, could you maybe um, try to model the spontaneous activity in each type of uh, hallucinating participant? Because you said that they all had very different types of hallucinations. Yeah, so good question. Do you see any kind of structural that's, differences? That's a very good question. Um, I didn't show you here any signal subject results. It's all in the paper. Um, in the interest of time, I didn't focus on these. But I think the amazing thing that we noticed was that although some individuals hallucinated faces predominantly and some hallucinated different categories, the pattern of activity actually engaged the entire visual cortex. And when you think about it, I mean, even if I show you a face, you would see activity across the visual system, you'd probably see more activation in your FFA, for example. In our case of the blind, uh, we tried to do these contrasts, trying to compare different uh, um, visual stimuli, uh, we didn't find any differences. So it could be the fact that, again, the entire visual system is activated, but this activity is, of course, probably lower than during very significant stimulation of uh, the visual system by outside stimuli. Um, and also maybe because we have a very small sample size. Um, so this is a very good question, and I really hope that it will be further studied to understand this. It's super fascinating. Great. Thank you. Okay, any last questions? Okay, so in that case, let's uh, thank Avidal for joining us. My pleasure, thank talk. you for having me. And we'll see each other next week for the next seminar. Thank you everyone, thanks Avital. Keep safe. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.